What's up, Carolina Crown? <laughs> loving, loving the energy right now. Absolutely love it. Everybody get a good meal? Yeah. Everybody got their notebook? Yeah. Everybody got their guided notes? Yeah. Those guided notes look pretty sweet, don't they? Yeah. All right, awesome, cool. Well, it's time to get started. Uh, the administration and staff have been uh, really supportive and gracious enough to give me an hour tonight. I'm going to be honest, I could, I could talk from here through finals night and never stop talking and still not cover it and still be equally as excited. So we're going to cram a lot in. So I need to know that you're dialed in, that you're intentional, that your, your phones are on like airplane mode, that you're not going to have anything distract you because what high performers do is they're very intentional. And I know that when I go to an event, I got my notepad, I'm focused in, I am 100% dialed in and I don't let anything distract me. And that's what's going to allow you to get the most out of what we're about to do here. So I, mean, I need to know that you are focused, yeah? yeah? Awesome, okay, cool. Well, we're gonna get started. And tonight's session, I'm calling it the who, the why, the what, and the how. I'm gonna start out with a little bit about who I am, and I'm gonna ask you about who you want to become. We're gonna talk about why we're here, why I'm here and why you're here. Then I'm going to talk about the what. I'm going to drop some concepts on you. But I'm not going to be kind of what we typically see in a lot of the uh, leadership or motivational world where, I mean, have you ever had this where maybe you hear someone talk and then they leave and you're like, that was awesome. I don't really know how to do anything they just told me. Yep. That's never going to happen with me. That's why we're going to have the how. Because this really only works if I teach you how to do what you need to do to implement this stuff to actually become a better performer. And so that's what we're gonna cover. Sound good? Yeah. A culture, one thing I've learned owning multiple businesses and coaching multiple business owners in all industries, the culture of an organization is not created in a boardroom. So when I train my real estate company, we don't sit in our training room and I don't like go on the whiteboard and say, here's the culture of the company. We're gonna be hardworking. We're going to be supportive. We're going to have positive attitudes, right? No. What I do is I hire hardworking, supportive, positive people. The culture is made up of the people that are there. Now, what I want to do, what I want to have a hand in, well, really, let me rephrase that. What I want to teach you how to do and what you need to do is we want to develop a culture and a vibe around this organization that says, if you want to be a badass in life, I'm not just talking about winning a trophy in a caption or placing in the top drum corps in the world. I'm talking about if you want to get good at life, you come to Carolina Crown. That's where you learn discipline. That's when you learn how to get it done and be successful, really to achieve lifelong excellence. And Joe and I were talking about this because we were recording some sweet content right here before you all came in. And we talked about the fact that there's not a little asterisk on the truck that says, like, developing lifelong excellence until you age out. <laughs> it doesn't say that. And what I'm going to teach you over this season, if you implement it, will make you better at life. You will achieve levels of success you never thought possible. You will make more money than you ever thought you could. You will be able to serve the world better. And that's the message we want to send. You want to be part of Carolina Crown because you want to be better at life. Yeah, of course you're going to be good at drum corps. But a lot of drum corps can get you good at drum corps. You're going to be better at life. You're going to win in the game of life when you come to this organization. That's the vibe we want because, number one, that's going to set the tone for who we really are. Number two, that's the type of people we want to attract. And you're part of a legacy, and this legacy is going to be here long after you age out. And if you want to keep this legacy going, you are going to have a crucial part in the type of people we want to attract. So real quick, a little bit of background on me. Why am I here? Should, why should you be listening to me? Well, quick little background. So I actually got my start in the marching arts world. I've been involved for like 25 years. I started marching DCI when I was 14 years old. My dad marched DCI too. And uh, I was a trumpet player. Started out on soprano when we were still on bugles. You're probably like, damn, that guy's old. <laughs> oh, man. Um, and, and so I started in 1999 was my first year. I played soprano with the Jersey Surf. They're still around. That was back when we were called Division II and not open class. And I marched there for six years. I was soprano soloist, uh, horn sergeant, and then I was drum major for two years. Then I aged out with two years at Blue Devils on upper lead trumpet. After that, um, 
I got my bachelor's degree in trumpet performance, emphasis in jazz studies, and master's degree in music education, and I taught middle school music. All while doing that, I decided, you know, I love teaching, but marching is my passion, and I need to make a living doing this. And I viewed composition as the way to do it. So I started a company called Standing O Marching, which is kind of my baby today. Um, and I started that from scratch. So I'm a full-time music teacher. I'm like 22 years old. I got no idea what I was doing. I'm cold calling band directors. Can I write your show? Who are you? <laughs> right? My first year, I had two bands. My second year, I had one band. Over the course of eight years, through relentless consistency and massive action, I built my business up to making over a quarter million dollars a year. And I quit my teaching job. And I have 70 to 80 bands per year now that perform my music. And I get to clinic with them, and I absolutely love it. So that's a bit of my music background. After I quit teaching, I decided to take control of my health and fitness. And I went from being real overweight to becoming an award-winning natural bodybuilder. And I competed and won a lot of trophies. I don't compete anymore, but I still live that lifestyle. We moved to Texas from New Jersey, my wife and I, about four years ago. And uh, that's when I started a real estate company. So all in all, I own a few businesses, right? I have my music business. I'm a bodybuilding dude. I pick things up and put them down, OK? Um, I own a real estate company. I'm one of the top five performing agents in the country. So is my brokerage. And I also have a business of speaking, coaching, writing. I got my first published book coming out this year. And, uh, and I coach industries, all industries, businesses. Um, but this is where my passion is. And if you were to ask me when I was 14 years old, freshman in marching band, like living, eating, sleeping, breathing marching band, Rob, what do you want to do for the rest of your life? I would say, I want to be a motivational speaker for marching bands and drum corps. And 24 years later, here we are. Talk about delayed gratification, right? It's amazing. And so that's a little bit about me and, um, and why I'm here. And that leads me into, there, there are, I'm going to try in a short amount of time to express the level of gratitude I have for the administration, the staff here, who sees this vision. Because it would have been all too easy to say, like, mindset coaching, that's weird woo-woo stuff. We're not going to do that, right? Um, I got to give big props to a, a very, someone who's become a very dear friend of mine, Kevin Shaw, who we met many years ago. And we've uh, developed more of a, a great working relationship. And he was the one that was kind of the catalyst. And then he brought it to Sean McElroy, staff coordinator, who really saw the vision. And they brought it to Joe Roach, the new director, who also really saw the vision. And step by step, and you know, we all have the same fears. And I had fear too. I know the next person in the chain is going to be like, that's dumb. We're not going to do it. But you know what? There hasn't been one person in the staff, caption heads, everybody is so supportive behind this movement. And the, the impact that this is going to have on your lives and so many other lives is really incredible. We're breaking history. We're breaking history by being the first drum corps in the world to have a mindset coach. Now, I do want to let you know, mindset coaching is not new. We're not doing something that's like never, ever been done before. We're just doing something that's new to this world. And I think it's time. And I'm going to talk about why. But I really have to express my gratitude to, um, to Kevin, to Sean, to Joe, to Jim Williams, the CEO, to all the volunteers, the staff administration, the caption heads, because without their support, none of this wouldn't be happening. And uh, it really means the world to me that they see the value in it, and they are putting time and energy and resources into truly committing. You know, a lot of companies have a mission statement, but not a lot of companies really follow through on it. And they have proven that they really are committed to developing lifelong excellence. And, uh, I, and I love them, and my heart goes out to them. So if we can thank them, please. All right, let's get started. This is where you want to get your notepads out. Now, you have your guided notes, and I'm going to tell you when I'm going to say something that's in your workbook. But the reason you have a notepad is because I'm going to just, I'm, there are going to be things that I say that you're going to go, oh, and you want to write it down. I always have a journal with me. Every time I go to one of these events, I write it down. And on the way home, like on the plane, that would be a great time to decompress. Okay, or when you get home, if you drive, like decompress and kind of soak this stuff in. All right? So, so whenever you hear me say something that you're like, I like that, I resonate with it, write it down. I want to ask you a question, and I want you to close your eyes for a moment. And I love that we're all participating here. And my question is, who is the person that you want to become? Visualize it. See yourself in the future being the person that in your wildest dreams, if you were to wave a magic wand and say, if all of my dreams and wildest fantasies came true, and I could live a life that I'm not sure if I'm capable of, what would that life look like? 
Who would I be? How would I think? What am I wearing? Where do I live? What do I see? What is my outlook on life? What would that person say to me right now? I'm going to give you just a few seconds to really see it, like you can reach out and touch it. All right, thank you. Open your eyes. Does everyone have it? You all got it? Yeah? Are you, are you dreaming lofty dreams? Are you, really, are you re really reaching for it? Yes? Okay, i got to tell you something. Your habits will determine whether or not you achieve that. F.M. Alexander said, people don't change their future, they change their habits. Their habits determine their future. I'll give you that one more time because I see a lot of people writing it down. People don't change their future. They change their habits. Their habits determine their future. And we're going to learn today how to start that journey to developing the habits. Because when you see someone that is achieving something and you say, how did they live that life? How did they do, how did they do all that at such a high level? It's because they think differently than you and because they have the habits that get them to that place. And that's what we're going to learn. That's what we're going to start tonight. So, we talked about the who, let's talk about the why. It all starts with the why. When I say why, I mean your purpose for doing whatever it is you're doing. Now in this, and you can have multiple whys, right? My ultimate why is giving the best quality of life I can for my family. The relentless action I take, the long nights, the grind, the facing the rejection and continuing anyway is so that I can support my wife and my baby and all the kids we're gonna have and the people that work for me and all my companies and, and serve them the best I can, to serve you the best that I can. That's my ultimate why. But then there's other whys, like why are you here? Why are you here in, like, in Crown right now? We're trying to be in Crown right now. And your why has to be powerful. Your why has to like give you little butterflies. Your why has to be so aggressive that it almost makes you emotional. It needs to be what I call obeying your law, L-A-W, your life-altering why. Your law, your life-altering why needs to be that. It needs to be life-altering. It needs to say, I'm here because if I accomplish what I really want to here, it will change my life. It will change the trajectory of my life. That is how strong your why should be. So I want you to ask yourself for a moment, and this is where you start writing down your workbook. Why are you here? And I want to tell you right now, there is no right or wrong why. As you're writing it down, and it's okay, you don't have to look at me here, you can write down your why, but I'm going to read you a few whys. Who was on our virtual session we did uh, in December? Most of you. Okay, great. Great, great, great. Awesome. Thank you. And you remember I had that poll on my big interactive vibe board and we could see the why. So I'm going to read you just some of the whys I have here. Self-fulfillment and pride. Awesome. To be the teacher I wanted when I was marching. Right? I had an amazing instructor when I was in high school, but my band director was terrible. And I was like, I'm not going to do it that way. That can also be valuable. To be able to make something I'm proud of. To help myself and others become the best, best version of themselves. Inspire future students as I've been inspired by my instructors. And I want to be the best in the world. All of those are great whys. Your why is your own. There's no right or wrong. Now raise your hand if you want to be the best in the world. Keep your hand up if you think that's going to be easy. Good. Thank you. I'm glad. Like, hey, it's going to be easy, right? No. OK, cool. So now the question is, as you have your why, the question I'm going to pose to you is, will you take the action that is necessary to achieve it? Because I guarantee you, you can do anything you want. I flew in a plane on the way here because the Wright brothers had a big why. I drive a Tesla Model S because Elon Musk has a big why. You're here because the people that started this organization had a big why. Some of them are in this room right now, like original founding members. They had a why. They still have a why. So you can accomplish anything you want. The question is, are you going to implement the action? And that's what I'm teaching you here. That's what we're learning. So now the what. What is mindset coaching? Anyone wondering that? It's cool if you are. It's OK. Thousands of people saw the post on social media, 
And a lot of the questions were like, this is awesome. What's that? Right? Ralph Waldo Emerson said, the mind, once stretched by a new idea, never returns to its original form. Once you see it, you can't unsee it. Once you hear it, you can't unhear it. So let me ask you a question. And go ahead and raise your hand if you agree. Do you agree with me if I say your actions are initiated from your thoughts? That makes sense, right? Good. You have a thought and then you do something. If you want to do something, you think to yourself, how do I do that? And then you do it. So then the next question in the chain is, well, where do your thoughts come from? A lot of people don't, <laughs> don't take it that next step. If your actions are, stem from your thoughts, where do your thoughts come from? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Uh, yeah, right here. Uh, your, experiences. your experiences. Great. What else? Your mindset. Yes, your mindset. Good. Absolutely. Now, I would love to call on everybody, but we'll be here all night, and I want to be respectful of the time the organization is giving me. Your thoughts come from your mindset. And what I have found in my many years of entrepreneurship and coaching is that your mind, just like any other muscle in your body, can be conditioned and developed. So you do actually have control over the thoughts that you think. Now, raise your hand if you've ever thought that you're, like, the mindset you're born with, that's just it. My mindset is fixed, and there's really only so far I have. And if someone is doing something that is bigger, and, and I want to accomplish that, they just have something special that I don't. I don't have what they have. There's just a unique X factor, and I don't have that, and I never will. Has anyone ever thought that? Come on, be real. Be real with me now. I have. I used to think that. Thank you. When I was real out of shape, I used to look at all the skinny kids and be like, how come I'm big and they're not? How come that kid can do pull-ups and I can't? How come that kid has abs and I'm like, bloop, right? Why? I guess I'm not meant to look like that. And then I got a coach that taught me how to get ripped and win bodybuilding shows. And I just did what they said. Is it harder for some people than others? Yeah, sure. That's okay. But the reality is that you can do anything you want if you have the right mindset. And so here's the principle. If your actions stem from your thoughts and your thoughts stem from your mindset, doesn't it make sense that a new mindset can spur new actions? Yes or no? Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay, so here's the chain. You get an idea. Imagine, visualize with me, a circle, yeah? You get an idea that is planted. It could be from an external source, like me right now, giving you a new idea. Or maybe you read a book or watch a YouTube video or something, or you're reading the book, High Performance Habits, that I told you to read. So you get an idea. Through speed of implementation, you take new action. Now keep in mind the idea only works if you act on it. Knowledge without implementation is useless. So you get the idea, you take action. Actions lead to new results. New results need to lead to new ideas, because you say, hey, I never thought I was capable of this thing. Look what I did. What else can I do? I'm going to learn some new ideas. New actions, new results leads to new actions, new results leads to new actions, new results, new ideas. And it goes around and around. And it never stops if you choose to take the action behind it. So that's really the essence of mindset coaching. It's teaching you how to think differently, to take new actions to achieve things you never thought was possible. I can do it. You can definitely do it. OK? And the truth is that when you see people, Elon Musk, Oprah, Grant Cardone, Richard Branson, and you say, how do they do that? The answer is they think differently than you do. That's it. They, we all have the same 24 hours in the day. They just think differently. And so when I go to conferences, you know, I want to be a multimillionaire. I'm not a multimillionaire yet. I'm getting there. But I want to be, so what do I do? I pay a lot of money to be in the room with other multimillionaires because I want to learn how they think because they think differently than I do. If I thought the way they think, I'd be there by now. But I haven't accomplished that, so I need to be around people that have. When you think differently, you take new actions, that is where the life-altering thoughts can happen that allow you to accomplish your why. So that's really what we're doing here. I'm teaching you how to think new things, to do new things, to accomplish new things. Does that make sense? Yeah? yeah? Good. OK, cool. Awesome. And again, I want to let you know we're not doing anything that's never been done before. OK? Look at professional athletic organizations. Of any sport, they have mindset coaches. The top performers in those organizations, like Olympic athletes, right, or like the Michael Jordans of the world. They even have their own mindset coaches on speed dial. They have people that get paid silly money to be on retainer. So when one of those athletes whose names you have on your jerseys 
is like not feeling it and they're not performing and they got a big thing coming up, they call that person and say, help me, I need you here right now. Get on my private jet because I'm not performing well and I gotta perform in two days and I need you to fix me. That happens every single day. Fortune 500 companies, billionaires, successful entrepreneurs in all industries have coaches that work on their mindset. So we're not doing something that's never been done, we're just doing something that's never been done here. But fortunately, I have the skill set from my marching background and my music background and my entrepreneurial business background to kind of have the perfect storm that I know where you are because I live that life. And we can really customize what we're doing for drum corps. So what I'm telling you now, like some of the, some universal principles exist, but what you're doing, like what I'm teaching you, it's not like this is the same thing I tell everybody else. This, is, this has been created for Carolina Crown. Make sense? Yeah. Good, okay. Let's talk about habits. Next thing on your workbook. Let's have some participation. Tell me, what is a habit? How would you define a habit? Something you do without thinking. Something you do without thinking. Cool, good, what else? Yeah, in the back, black sweatshirt. Something good or bad that you do Sorry, louder? Something good or bad that you do Oh, something good or bad you do consistently. Anybody got bad habits? Yeah, right? Okay, good, something good or bad that you do consistently. Very good, what else? Anybody? Yeah. Nice, something you don't have to force yourself to do. Good, good. Those are all great definitions, I love them. Okay, cool. Now again, I wanna remind you, people don't change their future, they change their habits. The habits determine the future. Now, here's the thing about habits, and someone asked me this on the last virtual training we did. They say, Rob, how do you form a new habit? Like, how do you get that habit to be on autopilot, as you all said, without thinking about it? You don't have to force yourself to do it, you just do it. Can we all agree that habits are kinda of like something you do on autopilot? Does anyone have to tell you to brush your teeth? Hopefully not. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so here's the thing. When you start a new habit, I don't think it's a habit yet. Because it takes reps on that habit to, be, to kind of make it automated. Yeah, do you agree? So write this in your workbook. I believe habits start as disciplined decisions. Habits start as disciplined decisions at first. They're not habits yet because they're new. Now, when someone asks me, Rob, how long does it take to form a habit? Well, who remembers the average number? 66 days, that's what research shows. However, it could be shorter, it could be as long as a year. It depends on the habit. Now, I believe, through my experience, because I've, I've certainly developed a lot of habits, a lot of great habits, that it takes results to develop the habit. Until you have your own proof of concept that says this habit works, you have to have discipline to make that decision. And most likely, you're not gonna feel like doing that thing initially. It's gonna be new. And you're gonna say, I don't wanna do that. But if you can have the discipline to do it, once you start getting the results, that's when you go, oh, this works. I'll give you an example, how I started practicing trumpet. Because I never really took trumpet seriously until I got to marching band. And in my school, we had the concert band and the wind ensemble. And everyone had to audition for wind ensemble and that's how they did the placement. So even if you're like, I'm not good enough to be in one ensemble, I don't even want to be in one ensemble, you had to audition anyway. And I wasn't that good, I was like third trumpet in marching band. Like I could play a middle C like nobody's business, man, and that was it, <laughs> okay? But we had to audition and we had a trumpet piece called Rondo Capriccio, and he played that? Yeah, it's 12-8. And I remember looking at the music, I'd be like, I don't know what 12-8 is, I don't know how to read it. There are notes above the staff, I didn't even know that existed, right? So my dad was a trumpet player and he taught me how to practice. And I didn't necessarily have a goal to make wind ensemble, but I had a standard for myself that if I'm gonna play this piece that's really hard and I don't even know how to read, I'm just gonna practice as much as I can. Because I wanna do my best because if I'm gonna sound terrible in front of my new band director, I at least wanna know that I've done my best. I at least wanna know that I've practiced really hard and I gave it my best, and even if I get last chair concert band, I can at least go to sleep at night knowing I didn't have, you know, go through the motions with this thing. I really tried my best and gave it my all. And so my dad helped me practice and I got better. And, and you know what really, it was a crazy thing happened. You know what happened? I improved. I know. It's crazy, right? And all of a sudden, these notes I couldn't hit, there's this one part, the G, A, G, above the staff. And one day I went to play those notes and they came out of the other end of the bell. And I was like, dude, practicing works! 
oh my gosh, <laughs> game changer, right? And so then, when I had the proof of concept that ha practicing works, do you think I was more motivated to practice? Right? Do you think uh, it was less like, oh, I have to practice now, and more like, I get to practice now? Yeah, because I knew that it worked. But until then, I was just doing it. And so habits start as disciplined decisions. I believe until you get the proof of concept, that's when they become habits. That's when they become habits. When I learned how to eat right, and that was finally was the key that got me like, I do have a six pack under there. That's when no one ever had to tell me again, and I never had to have discipline to eat clean. You get the proof of concept. So habits start out as disciplined decisions until you know they work. That's when they become on autopilot. So think about the habits you want to instill. You have to have discipline until it starts working. Then they become habits. And don't, you know, if you want to go hard and try to change your whole life overnight, go for it. If you want to instill one habit at a time, go for it, as long as you're making effort to improve. Make sense? Cool, okay. Let's talk about, we're gonna, we're gonna start getting into the, the seven habits of high performers. Now, one of the caption heads asked me to talk about mental toughness a little bit. Anyone ever hear that phrase, mental toughness? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me, I think mental toughness is kind of like fear of failure in a sense that like it's a very big term that's actually comprised of many different habits. So when you put all these habits together, you are mentally tough. And everyone can be the type of person that can be mentally tough. The question is, we all have the same decisions. We all have the same obstacles. We all have the same fear. The question is, are you going to take action or not? Trust me, I have the same fears that y'all have, the same little cynical voice that says, what if people think mindset coaching is dumb? What if Crown puts out the announcement and everyone's like, that's dumb. Who's this Rob Stein guy? Get him out of here. I had those thoughts, but I was like, I believe in my vision. And man, one of my coaches has a great phrase. He says, I'm looking for people that are looking for me. I'm looking for people that find value in what I have to offer. And I know there are people like that. You don't like it? Don't watch my video. <laughs> what, what can I do, right? And so you take action anyway, and that is how you become mentally tough. Check out this quote. I want you to write this down. Do you, do you all agree that at this level, you're like professional drum corps people? Yeah. Right? Marching band might be like the minor leagues. You're in the major leagues right now, yeah? yeah? Don't forget to take some pictures, crown mindset. Now, professionals don't listen to their feelings. Professionals don't listen to their feelings. If you spend your day doing what you feel like and not what is necessary, you will not win. You will not be a high performer. You're not going to get what you want. If you're faced with a decision that what you feel like doing but what you know is necessary are different, do what's necessary. That's what you got to do. Now, I'm going to be real with you. Because I think there's a huge misconception of successful people and entrepreneurs, people that you find, I think social media has really done a bad job of this, right? Is they make you think like that people that are crushing it have no adversity, that they face no obstacles. Anyone ever, it's okay, do you think that about people? Like you see them and they're like, man, they're just winning 24 seven. They just wake up and bathe themselves in money and have no stress. Not true. I wake up at 4.45 every day. I'm in the office at 5.30. More often than not, I don't feel like being in there. Sometimes I do, but I'm, I'm tired <laughs> when I wake up just like you are. The difference is I turn my alarm off, I get dressed, I get out of bed, I get my coffee, and I go in and I crush it. And then I start getting excited because I'm achieving momentum. Some days I'm, I'm ready, I'm like, let's go. But some days, I mean, I got a newborn. If she's up all night and I can't get any sleep and my, and my wife is, you know, helping because she, she really handles all the baby stuff, right? And, and, and I'm still tired because the baby's waking me up. I'm tired. Sleep to deprivation is real for everybody. But I do what's necessary. I do what's necessary and I keep making those decisions. The reality is, it's just one decision at a time. So you don't have to feel like, if, if looking down forever is being overwhelming, just make one right decision at a time. But, when you're, but professionals don't listen to their feelings. And I hate when people are like, oh, I'm not feeling it today. Rob, how do you stay motivated? I'm not motivated right now. I'm just doing it anyway. That's it. Right? That's all, okay? And there's a misconception that to really thrive, 
You always have to be passionate about what you're doing. I'm here to tell you that's not true. You don't always have to be passionate about what you're doing, but you do have to be passionate about why you're doing it. When you don't feel like doing something you know you need to do, ask yourself, why should I do this? How is it going to benefit me from doing this? Let me give you some practical implementation right now. Here's something I do. It really helps. I talk out loud to myself. I just talk out loud to myself. So if there's something I don't feel like doing, I'm in my office alone, and I say, Rob, who is going to get hurt if you don't do this thing? It's not just me. It's my family. It's my employees. It's people I'm trying to serve. It's you. Right? I was like falling asleep on the plane on the way here. I was tired. My baby's going through a sleep regression right now. She's not sleeping at all. But I'm like, man, but if I don't finish this presentation, I'm not serving the members optimally. So I did it anyway, because I was passionate about why I'm doing it. And guess what? I'm up here right now, and I'm really glad I did. So you're passionate about why you're doing it. It's OK to not be passionate about what you're doing. I spend about half my day not being passionate about the task I'm doing at the time, but then I think about why I'm doing it and how I'm going to benefit from it. And I guarantee you, if you say, if you don't do this right now, uh, what's your name right here? Alex. Alex. OK. If Alex is standing in his room and Alex says, Alex, if you don't do this right now, you are not going to get any closer to achieving your goals. I guarantee you he's going to do the thing he's supposed to do. So just try saying that out loud. If I don't do this right now, I'm only pushing my own finish line further away. I guarantee you you're going to do the thing when you actually say it and you don't just think it. Let's talk about the top seven habits of the top 1% of performers. You ready? Everybody got their notebook? Yep. Show me your pen. Wave it in the air. Woo, let's go. The pen is mightier than the sword. Come on. All right. Y'all like this too? Isn't it nice and branded? Doesn't it look beautiful? Yeah, all right. Cool. You know I got to do it up for you guys. Come on. Oh, and huge thank you to Mr. Joe Roach and the admin for printing in color. Yeah, seriously. I was like, they're going to use like, like 1,500 sheets of paper. There's no way they're printing in color. And they did. Awesome. So thank you. Now, these habits, when you have them, make up what I call the bulletproof mindset. The first one you're writing down is grit. Grit. The definition of grit is unyielding effort in the face of adversity. Unyielding. Nothing. A brick wall cannot stop your grit. Now, personally, you know, I'm always going to be real with you, right? Okay. I think there's a nationwide grit shortage right now. I think social media is largely responsible for that. I think the fact that we as humans have the ability to have more instant gratification than we've ever had in our history of evolution has made people a little soft. It's just my opinion. You agree? Yeah, you know you do. I bet, I bet a lot of you see it in a lot of your peers. It's OK, yeah? yeah? Yeah. Here's the thing. If you're in this room, you've already got a lot of these things going for you. Because you can't be in one of the best drum corps in the world without already understanding this. Because you wouldn't have been in this seat, even if you're auditioning and haven't been offered a spot yet. You wouldn't be sitting in this room if you didn't have all these seven habits right here that I'm going to teach you. You got to have grit, right? Meaning, if you don't want to do it, you just do it, because you're gritty, man. Guess what? Life is hard. It's going to get a lot harder, and the world doesn't care about your feelings. The world doesn't owe you anything. When you have a job, and you're late, or you don't meet a deadline, your boss isn't going to be like, it's OK. Don't worry about it. They're going to be like, hey, you're fired. You're super fired. The real world is hard, man. And the truth is that I think a lot of young adults today are not being set up for success because they're being told that, like, don't worry about competition. Right? Just really, like, just, you know, be happy. Don't face any adversity. That's not true, and that's not realistic. That's not how life is. And if you can be gritty now, you're going to be so set up for success later. I promise you. you got to have grit. When you don't feel like doing something, you got to do it. When life is hard, you just do it anyway. I'll tell you a little story about grit. Uh, I was talking with, with, with Kevin about this earlier. Um, 
So what, right out of college, I had my master's degree and I got a, a gig teaching elementary school band actually at the high school that I went to, or the elementary school that I went to. It was like across the street from my house. So I lived at home, sleeping in my childhood twin bed, banking my salary. Now I was 22 making 55 grand a year, which when you're 22, might as well be like a million bucks, right? And I had, it was a great school, I was getting paid good money, I was living at home, I was paid off, paying off all my student loans. And I got a call one day from a really prominent music company that makes um, musical instruments for the marching arts. And I had a connection there and they said, Rob, we wanna interview you to be like one of the vice presidents of the company. Whoa, really? Yeah, all right. So they fly me out for the interview, take me to fancy restaurants, and they're like, you're gonna be a rock star. Literal words. Rob, your poster is gonna be on every band room in the country. You're gonna be walking around the lot. You're gonna be mingling with the caption ads. You're gonna be going to world famous musicians, making sure they have what they need. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity for you. We want you to take the job. So I was faced with a decision. Do I keep my cushy job? And my, my current wife and I at the time, we were like just getting real serious. And I was like, I think I wanna marry this girl. Am I about to move? 2,000 miles away, I said, yes, this is a one time, once in a lifetime opportunity. And if I don't seize it, I'm gonna regret it forever. So I did that. I moved halfway across the country where I knew zero people. And I told this company, hey, I don't have any corporate experience. I'm like a teacher. They're like, no, we're gonna, you're gonna be fine. And so I get there and guess what? They lied to me. The old bait and switcheroo. I wasn't doing anything they said I would do. I was sitting in an office, a tiny office, a shared office, with a guy who was a percussionist his whole life, who was like in his early 40s, meaning he was hard of hearing, because drumming, loud. And we were back to back on the phone. So he's talking like this on the phone the whole time! And I'm like, oh my God, he's chain smoking cigarettes in the office. And I sat in my chair all day taking orders from music stores that wanted to buy our product. I didn't do one thing they told me I was gonna do. And I was like, are you serious? I left my family, the girl I'm gonna marry, my cushy job, my fat salary for this? I was, I was in a rough place, y'all. I didn't know anyone, I was lonely. It's like getting depressed, I knew zero people. And I was like, all right. I said to myself, I'm gonna give it a year because I owe it to myself, I made this decision, I'm gonna to commit to it, and if I still don't like it in a year, I'll leave and go back home. Fast forward a little bit, it's my 60 day evaluation, and I'm trying to have a positive attitude about it, and I go into the office, and I'm like, well, gang, you know, I think this is going pretty well, and they said, Rob, you're fired. What? It's not working out. You don't have the corporate experience. I was like, I told you that! They were like, this is not working out the way we thought. Now they fired me on day 59, because on day 60, according to my contract, they would have owed me a severance package, meaning they would have had to pay me some money. Out of a job, no teaching gig, what am I gonna do? 23, moved back home in with my parents. Finding a teaching gig was really hard. I couldn't find one for years. So I had this amazing thing, and I tried to pursue this dream and it wasn't what I thought it would be. So I could have cried about it. I could have got a minimum wage job. I could have said, woe is me, my life sucks. Why does this happen to me? I said, you know what? I'm gonna seize the opportunity. I took the opportunity to start my music business, standing on marching. I took the opportunity to take my health and fitness seriously, get in the gym, and guess what? Because I utilized that time I wasn't teaching to build my business, I was able to get my business started to the point where I could quit my teaching job and achieve financial freedom and be here standing in front of you. So what other people would perceive as an obstacle, I saw as an opportunity, because I said, this is happening whether I like it or not, so I may as well make the most of it. And I did, and I worked my butt off, man, and it worked out, because I had grit, and that's what it takes. And I guarantee you, something like that's gonna happen to you. You're gonna be going along your life one day, and all of a sudden, life is gonna punch you in the gut, out of nowhere, and grit is gonna get it through. You got some grit, yeah? yeah? Good, all right, that's grit. Number two, massive action. Massive action. Now I define massive action as a level of action that you simply didn't know you were capable of. Because here's the thing, 
ask any one of your staff, any one of your designers, right? Your CEO, Jim Williams, Kevin Shaw, right? You got some of the best people in the world here. Ask them. Let me ask you, Jim, Jim may I ask you a question? Okay. Did it take more action than you ever thought possible to get where you are today? Absolutely. Yep. Kevin, one of the best percussion minds in the world designing your percussion book. Has it taken more action than you ever thought possible to achieve that status and be the guy for Crown? 100%. 100%. Drum majors, did it take more action than you ever thought possible to be drum majors at one of the best groups in the world? People that have been awarded a spot, did it take more action than you thought possible to be awarded a spot here? Yes. Took more action than I thought to build my music business? Took more action than I thought to win bodybuilding shows? Took more action than I thought to run multiple businesses and achieve financial freedom and write my first book and become like a YouTube guy? But I did it all because I realized, wow, I gotta do more. I gotta go up, I gotta find the new level, man. And that is massive action. Not a little bit, like more action when, when people look at me, they're like, how do you do all that? How do you do that much in that short amount of time? Bro, I just move faster than most people are willing to do. Not can do, but when people are like, Rob, what do you think is your, your, your superpower? Truthfully, it's very simple. I'm willing to do more things in a shorter amount of time than most people are willing to do. That's it. That's the fairy dust right there. I'm willing to do more things in a shorter manner of time than most people are willing to do. Notice I said not that most people can do. I'm just talking about that they're willing to do. That's it. And you can do the same thing. There's nothing stopping anyone from doing it. Massive action. Number three, discipline. Now, who can remind me what do habits start out as before they become habits? Very good. Disciplined decisions. Excellent job. Now, discipline, the way I define discipline is doing something when you don't want to do it. It's doing something when you don't want to do it. Mind if I come down a little bit? It's doing something when you don't want to do it, okay? It doesn't take discipline to do something you want to do. Just like courage is acting in spite of being afraid. It doesn't take courage to do something you're not afraid of. Just like it doesn't take discipline to do something you want to do. So discipline is doing something that you don't want to do, but you do it anyway. That is a discipline. I don't necessarily feel like going to the gym and crushing it in the gym every day or prepping my food every day. And when I don't feel like doing it, that's when I have the discipline to do it anyway because it's become a habit because I know the results I get when I do it. You're not going to feel like doing what you need to do every day to be the best in the world. I'm going to tell you that right now. It, you will not. But you have to have the discipline to still make the decision to do it. And, when, and again, that's the definition of drum corps. You stand here not moving. Discipline. I want to scratch my nose, but I can't. Dis <laughs> discipline. Right? That is the essence. Okay? You've got to have the discipline. Next up. Delayed gratification. Now, I think drum corps is like the pinnacle of delayed gratification because finals night is in August. The first competition is like six months away. Now, delayed gratification, quite simply, is working really hard now to get what you want later. Now, I've experienced delayed gratification over periods of like six months. Like when I start competing for a bodybuilding prep, you know, and I start at maybe like 10 or 11% body fat and get down to like 3% body fat. It's like six months. Launching my first business took eight years. My dream of being on this stage took 24 years. It's worth every day of it, man. That's delayed gratification. So you got to have delayed gratification because when you want to do big things, it doesn't happen right away. And the, the further you are from your goal, remembering that you can accomplish anything you want, but realistically, the further you are from the goal, the more delayed that gratification is going to be. The first time I lost 80 pounds and figured out that I got a physique under all that, that took a long time because I had a, lot, a long way to go. So you have to have delayed gratification. And again, a lot of people don't, especially your age, a lot of people don't have it. 
and it will give you a leg up on and off the field. That will really develop lifelong excellence, leg gratification. It's going to help you all the time. Number five, no victim mentality. Now, I'll tell you what, I have very few hot buttons, very few things that really like make me want to like boil my blood, okay? But victim mentality, I'm going to Hulk smash and flip tables right away. Right away, victim mentality. Let me tell you something. Everything that happens in your life, good and bad, is completely your fault. You're in complete control of it. You got a flat tire on the way to an appointment, your fault. Should have checked the tire pressure. When you have that mindset, you're unstoppable. Right? What I could have done is say, I was fired from this job. Why does this happen to me? Oh my God. And I was like, I was fired from this job. That stinks. I'm going to go take some action. Okay? Because the reality is, like, like, this isn't fair. There is no fair. Life just happens. Bad things happen to good people every day. That's just the reality. <laughs> it's just the reality, man. Right? And so knowing that you have complete control of it and not being a victim, that's going to be huge for you. Number six, accountability. Accountability is a lifestyle that you choose. Again, you are responsible for everything that happens to you. I'll tell you a real story about accountability. <laughs> now, one of the things I coach in is health and fitness. And I had a buddy of mine who I actually met in the marching world. He was a percussionist. And he was pretty out of shape, and he came to me, and we were really doing well together. I was giving him the plan. He was crushing it. He was losing weight. He was, like, taking pictures and posting them, like, look at how big my jeans used to be. Like, he was really doing well. And then what happened? He stopped being consistent, gained it all back, stopped coaching with me. Hey, man, all right, it's your decision. A few years later, I get a call from him. I haven't spoken to him in years. Hey, man, what's up? It's exactly what he says right away. Rob, I will give you $10,000 if you can get me to lose 100 pounds. I was like, what? What? Seriously, I'm going to give you $10,000 if you can get me to lose 100 pounds. I can tell he's really excited, a little nervous for this conversation, but that's what he said. I was like, bro, what's happening with you? I haven't talked to you in like four years. And he was like, dude, I'm making more money than I ever thought possible. Business is better than I ever thought possible. Providing for my family in a way I never thought I could, but... I am so out of shape, my wife is literally worried I'm going to die and leave her and my kids without me. That's a pretty big why, isn't it? So I'll give you $10,000 if you can get me to lose 100 pounds. So I understand he's passionate, but right away I'm like, mm, I don't know about this. Not if you can show me how, if you can get me to do it. And I was like, what exactly are you looking for? Like the same type of coaching we were doing before. He's like, no, man, I'm going to pay you a lot of money because I want you to be like on call, right? And this is exactly what he said. He goes, so for example, like let's say I'm staring down a sleeve of Oreos. And I got them in my hand and I'm like, oh my God, I want to eat these things so bad. I want to be able to call you and have you verbatim talk me off the ledge. And I was like, look, man, I'm going to be honest with you. If that's what you need, this is not going to work. You need to want this why. I mean, you're talking about, like, you don't want to die. That's, I, there's not a more power, there's literally not a more powerful why than that. And if you need me to want your success more than you want it, if you need me, like, literally need me to do that for you, this isn't going to be sustainable because what's going to happen when you lose 100 pounds and you don't call me anymore? Like, you have to be accountable to do this yourself. A coach does not spoon feed you and hold your hand and wipe your booty for you. A coach gives you the knowledge and then you implement it. But if you need me to do this for you, it's not going to work. And he was like, ah, let me think about it. Never called me again. Haven't spoken to him since that day. I, he's still pretty out of shape. It's reality. Accountability, man. You want something, then go get it. Be accountable. Rob, do you have more tips for consistency on nutrition? Yeah, make better decisions. What else? I mean, it's, what do you expect me to say? Rob, do you have any tips on how I can consistently get my exercise in? Yeah, make the decision to get your exercise in. You're welcome. <laughs> Be accountable to yourself. Be accountable to yourself. Okay, last one, number seven. Prioritize your physical health. There's a common thread in high performers. They wake up early. They eat clean. They work out every single day. 
because when you are, when your blood is moving and you feel good, you feel confident about how you look, you feel confident in the way you eat, you just perform better. I'll tell you exactly what happened because I didn't get a lot of sleep last night. I don't sleep well when I travel. And we had an early day. I had an amazing breakfast with, with Jim and Kevin today. It was awesome. But I didn't get a lot of sleep last night and I was, I was busy today. And then about three o'clock, I was in the library finishing my notes and I'm like falling asleep. And I'm petrified of getting up here being groggy. And I was like, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back to my hotel and work out. And that's what I did. I went into the gym. There was like, like three dumbbells and an elliptical machine. That was the gym. But I was like, all right, I'm going to do it. And you know what? I felt so good after that. And I was fired up. Okay? When you eat better, when you exercise, when you take care of your body, that is when you're really performing at the high level. I guarantee you if you're eating bad or you're not eating or you're not exercising, you're going to be sluggish. It's not going to happen for you. Okay? You have to prioritize your physical health. Make sense? Yeah. Seven habits. You ready to move on? Everybody good? Yeah. We're kind of near in the back half of this thing. I got to know you're still with me. Yeah? yeah? All right. How do you have confidence in something that you've never done before? What if you want to get ripped and you're like, I've never been ripped before? The answer is cyclical confidence. And cyclical confidence is a concept I created for my new book. And it is a combination of faith and confidence. That's what you're writing in. Faith and confidence. I'll give you an example, then I'll break it down. When I started my music business, right? When I started my real estate business, I had already started another business before. By the time I started my coaching business, I'd started multiple businesses. But when I started my music business, I was a music teacher. No business experience. Now, I started to ask myself, what is confidence? Now, I believe confidence comes from experience. Good or bad experience in the thing you're trying to do. So let's say you're trying to build a business. It works. Great. You have confidence you can build a business. You try to build a business. It fails. Okay. Well, at least you learned what doesn't work. And now you're more confident that when you try again, you're going to be more on the right track. Make sense so far? Yeah. But you have to have experience in the exact thing you're trying to do to have any degree of confidence in it. So the question is, well, what if you're trying to do something for the first time? I don't think you can have confidence. But what you can have is faith. Now, I'm not talking about religious faith. That's another topic for another day. I'm talking about faith in yourself. And here's what you have is you have faith that you can do the new thing you're trying to do. Because I guarantee you, especially if you're sitting in this room, at some point in your life, you've accomplished something that you had to have certain characteristics for. As an example, when I started my first business, I said, well, I've never started a business before. But I'll tell you what I have done. I, I went to college for five years, got a bachelor's and a master's degree, and graduated top of my class. I got a great job in a great district. I played trumpet at some of the best marching and jazz ensembles in the world. That took delayed gratification. It took hard work. It took grit. And because I at least did those things, I believe I have what it takes to do the new thing. I have faith in myself that I can do it. Now, once you start getting results, that's when you get confidence. So like when I sold my first show to a band that didn't know who I was, that was the first time I got confidence. Like, hey, this works. The first time I had 10 bands, 20 bands, 30 bands, 40 bands, 50 bands. The first time I made over six figures, 100,000. First time I made 150,000. First time I made a quarter million. New confidence levels. But at first I had faith. But now the cool thing is when I started my real estate business, I said, hey, I've never started a real estate business, so I don't have confidence I can start a real estate business. But I did start a really thriving music business, so I have faith I can start my real estate business. Once I started that business and started winning, I had confidence I could do it. Does that make sense? So when you're doing something you haven't done before, it starts with faith. You get results, that leads to confidence. And then you're like, okay, I had a little bit of success in this thing. Now I'm going to the next level. I've never gotten to the next level, so I don't have confidence I can do it, but I have faith because I did this thing here. Faith, confidence, faith, confidence, faith, confidence. It's cyclical. So that's how you do it. So if you're trying to do something you've never done before, have faith that you can do it because you're in this room. And then when you start winning, you'll have confidence, and that feeds itself. That's how, when you're doing something you've never done before, that's how you have the faith and the confidence you can do it. Make sense? Everybody like that one? It's pretty sweet. Okay, cool. All right. Now, we're moving on to the second page. This is going to be a quick one. The four fears. Sneak peek from my upcoming book called Impossible to Fail. Because I truly believe if you get the right education from someone who's done what you're trying to do 
and you implement it with massive action, relentless consistency, and time, it is literally, scientifically, impossible to fail if you do it for long enough. Because I believe failure is only failure if it's permanent. Failure is only failure if you quit, if it's permanent. Otherwise, you're learning. When you were learning how to walk as a baby, you didn't fail when you fell down. You just messed up, right? No one failed at walking, right? So here's the thing. When you are going to start implementing some of these things, you're going to face some fear. Now, I have broken down in the book fear of failure into four subcategories. I'm going to tell you what they are now real quick. And I guarantee you that when you have like an obstacle that you're facing and you're hesitant to do something, I promise you it is one or a combination of these four fears that are stopping you. And now that you know about it, you're going to be able to conquer them, okay? Now, the first one is fear of imperfection. Raise your hand if you've ever had that. Yep, me too. Both hands and feet in the air, right here. That's totally normal. No one Raise your hand if you love doing stuff you're not good at. Okay, some of you do. That's cool, good. Now, do you have more fun once you get better at something? Yeah. yeah. Now, here's the thing. And if you follow me on social, you saw me put a video out about this. It gained some good traction. When someone says to me, you know, Rob, you don't get it, man. I'm a perfectionist. That's what their mouth is saying, but what their actions are saying is, I'm a procrastinator. Oh, burn. It's true. Because here's the thing. Is perfection possible? No. Yes. Yes. Yes, it is. Now, I'm not talking about like being the perfect person, but listen to Wynton Marcellus play Carnival of Venice. Is that perfect? Yes? Yes, it is. Listen to when Marcellus play Carnival of Venice. Tell me that's not perfect. Of course it is. You can achieve perfection at certain tasks, or at least insanely high levels of mastery. But guess what? You can only do that through reps. So if you were really a perfectionist, you would have no hesitation to start taking action because you would realize the fastest way to achieve perfection is by taking action and being imperfect until you become better. So when you're like, oh, I'm afraid to mess up, everyone's afraid to mess up, but you're not going to get good until you start. And every day you delay is another day that you're delaying achieving that level of mastery that you want for yourself. So fear of imperfection is a big one, but you got to push past it because the only way to get past it is to actually do the thing to get better at it. That's fear of imperfection. Number two, fear of the unknown. Anyone ever have that one? I'll tell you, when I had that one, when I started my YouTube channel, I was really resistant towards it, and I didn't want to do it. And I'm like, oh, i got to get this camera. i got to get this lighting. What if people don't like it? What if, you know, i got to learn how to edit. Oh, my, oh, I'm a perfectionist. I'll do it later. Yeah, right? Now, here's the thing. Fear of the unknown is actually a survival mechanism built into our DNA. Because we wouldn't be in this room if our ancestors didn't fear the unknown, right? Hunter-gathering days, there's a rustle in that bush. Could be a bear, could be a lion, it could be the wind. Let's go check it out. Dead, right? Fear of the unknown keep, kept people alive. But here's the other cool thing about fear of the unknown. It is within the human spirit to fear the unknown and conquer it anyway. Again, I flew here on a plane because the Wright brothers conquered fear of the unknown. I drive my electric car because Elon Musk conquered that fear. We're all here because at some point, the first person built a ship and conquered the fear of the unknown of the ocean. So it is within you as a human being to conquer the unknown that you're so afraid of. So just do it. Number three. Fear of judgment. When I started my YouTube channel, I had fear of the unknown and fear of judgment. I don't know how to use all this equipment, and what if people don't like me? What if, what if Crown makes the announcement and people say, that mindset coaching's dumb? There, there were some people that have said that, and I'm like, whatever, bro. You don't have to come to my seminars. <laughs> I don't care, right? Now, again, fear of judgment is a survival mechanism. When we were in our tribal community days, you only survived if you got along with your tribe. If they didn't like you, they would kill you or just leave you to die. Now, I'm not saying you shouldn't care what people think. I mean, you have to be able to get along with people and have good relationships. That's essential for life and business. But at the same time, what you're, you, the fear of judgment that you're so afraid of, 
You know, Ed Milet, who's a great, a great speaker and one of my favorites, has a phrase, he called these people the extras. The extras of life. You know the extras in the movie? Taxi driver one, bouncer at the club number two. They don't even get names in the credits. Those are the people you're so afraid of. They're too busy thinking about themselves to think about you. It's okay. Now again, I'm gonna remind you, you're looking for people that are looking for you. Don't be afraid to be judged. Because if people make some BS judgment about you, whatever, who cares? Right? Some kid comments on Instagram, oh, who mindset coaching, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, whatever, dude. I obviously don't want to learn. You don't want to learn from me, and I don't want you in one of these seats. I don't care. Right? Let them. Be true to yourself and do what you know you need to do. Lastly, this is the big one. I saved the best for last. Fear of sacrifice. Oh. <laughs> Fear of really doing, like, are you willing to make the sacrifices that are necessary for you to achieve your goals? Getting ready for a bodybuilding prep is not easy because you get, like, way leaner than you're supposed to be. And your body literally thinks you're starving and dying. It's not an exaggeration. You're, like, your hormones get weird. You go into, like, this depression funk because your body is so desperately just trying to survive on the little amount of nourishment and the insane amount of exercise that you're doing. And it literally thinks you're starving. And every fiber of your being from hundreds of thousands of years of evolution saying, stop, sleep, go eat a steak, you're killing yourself. But was I willing to sacrifice what was necessary? When I built my music business, I would wake up early, I would go to school, I'd be there at 7 a.m., I would teach band after school, I'd come home at 5 p.m., and then I'd write music until 10 p.m. I did that for eight years. Talk about sacrifice, man. Was it worth it? Yeah, because it's not forever. It's short-term sacrifice now to get what you want later. But most people aren't willing to pay the price. What is the price? It's time. It's sacrifice. It's when your friends are like, bro, you never come out anymore. You're like, yeah, I'm trying to crush it at life. I don't got time for that stuff. That's the sacrifice. I've had so many Sundays in my office. We live in a little cul-de-sac, and I look out of my shutters, and I see my neighbors sitting, and the kids are playing. It's a nice spring day, and they got their drinks and their chairs, and they're playing, and there's music going, and I'm like, that looks awesome. Back to work. It's not forever, but I'm trying to do some big moves right now, man, and so I do what's necessary. It's fear of sacrifice because most people are afraid to make the sacrifices. And when they see you making the sacrifices, they might project their fear onto you. Why do you do all that? I wouldn't do all that. Well, I know you wouldn't do all that, but I'm doing all that. Right? So it's always going to be one or a combination of those. You might be fear of sacrifice, fear of imperfection, fear of whatever. But I guarantee you when you're facing some obstacles, think, look back to these notes. Look back to those four and say, what thing or combination of things is, is at play right now? and then you can conquer it. Yeah? yeah? Okay, you ready to wrap up? Yeah. All right. You still want to be the best in the world? Yeah. I'm just checking. Now we're on to the last bit, the how. So how are we going to implement this? I'm going to tell you how we implement. We have a custom curriculum for Crown. So obviously I'm here. I'm going to be back in May. I'm meeting with a leadership team tomorrow. We're going to have virtual events. I have the private Crown YouTube channel, and I'm going to be giving you things to implement. But I've already given them to you. Like explaining the four fears. Because when you want to do something you shouldn't do or you're afraid to take action, you can now look at the four fears and say, you know what, Rob's right. It's this and this, and now I know it, and now I conquer it, and now I do the thing. Can you implement that? Yes, yes you can. If you're not making it happen and you say, which one of the seven qualities of high performers do I need right now? I need more grit. Rob, talk to me about grit. I'm going to give myself some grit. Can you implement that? Yes. yes. If you commit... It will be life-changing. And I'm going to be back throughout the season. I'm going to be back in move-ins. I'm going to be back for regionals. I'm going to be here finals week. Let's go, man. This is not a flash in the pan. Rob's going to come and pump us up and leave. Because the administration is committed to making this a season-long thing. And, like, not just for this season. Right? This is going to be huge for you. It's going to be huge for you. And I hope you take advantage of it. All right. Number six on your workbook as we wrap up. You're going to eliminate the word try from your vocabulary. That is a low performer word. The word try has a magnificent failure rate. Let's say you tell someone, hey, I'm having an event. You want to come? And they say, oh, I'll try to be there. Are they going to be there? How many times have you said, I'm going to try to do this thing and actually done it? 
Most of the time you don't do it, do you? Here's why. When you say the word try, you're already planting the seed. In, it, it, it's, it's a mechanism you give yourself so that if you fail, it's okay because you were only trying to do it. So when you say, I'm going to try to do this thing, you're definitely only going to put a half-hearted effort into it because you're just trying. It never works. Here's what I like. I like to say, I'm going to do this thing. Not, I'm going to try to eat better. Like, I'm eating, I'm, I'm implementing the habit of eating better. Now, what I really like doing is I don't like talking about something I'm going to do before I do it. It kind of gives you a dopamine fix, doesn't it? Well, we, we've got Mark, right? If I'm like, Mark, I'm going to start working out this week, man. It's going to be great. It gives me a dopamine fix to tell him that. And he's like, you are? And I'm like, yes, I will. Right? But I'm probably not going to do it. So what I like to do is I start the new habit, and then I tell people, here's what I'm doing right now. Start the thing. You don't have to announce it to the world. I know you like to. I know you like to make your social media posts. You don't have to actually do that. What I recommend is, number one, stop saying the word try. Never say it again. Say, I am. I will. I am right now. I did. That's the best one. But don't say the word try anymore. Low performers say try. High performers don't even say anything. They just do it. Okay? You got that written down? Okay, good. You got to create smart goals. S stands for specific. Anybody reading? Now, y'all know I reply to like every comment on Facebook and YouTube, right? You seen that? Good. So when someone says like, I'm going to practice my thing every day. Great. For how long? Let's be specific. I'm going to get better at this exercise. Great. What tempo are you going to play this exercise at? Let's be specific. So S stands for specific. So when you create your goals, create very specific goals. Very specific goals. M stands for measurable. Have a metric that you can do it. I'm going to eat better. What does that mean? I'm going to eat a clean breakfast every day. All right, that's cool. That's specific and measurable. A stands for achievable. Now, I believe that achievable is rather a subjective term. But what I think is that you create what I call stretch goals. If you have a goal and you're like, no doubt that's achievable, is it aggressive enough? No. no. Your, your, your goal needs to give you a little knot in your stomach because you're never going to break to another level if you already know how to do the thing. You only break into new levels when you're doing something you've never done before. And so when I set a goal, there's how much money I want to make. Here's the course I want to put out, right? 2023 is going to be my first million dollar year. I guarantee it. I've come close. I've never broken that seven figures. I'm going to do it. Does that give me a knot in my stomach? Yes. But guess what? If I was like, I'm only going to make $100 more than I did last year. No problem. What's the point? Your goals need to really stretch you. S-M-A. R stands for relevant. If your goal is to be a better brass player, why are you messing around on Facebook for two hours a day? Ouch. Oh, man. <laughs> right? If your goal is to eat better, why are you eating, you know, Chick-fil-A? Come on. Right? Be relevant. Your goals need to be relevant for what you're trying to do. Last one, T stands for time bound. <clears throat> you can't measure your progress if you don't have an endpoint. So some people will be like, I'm going to get better at my warm ups. What I recommend you say is, I'm going to play exercise number 13 at 180 beats a minute by January 31st. That's a specific, measurable, time bound goal. I will be able to run three miles by February 20th in under 35 minutes. That is specific, measurable, and time bound. But the thing is, how can you hit a target? Or I should say, how, do you, how can you hit a bullseye when you don't have a target? Right? You've got to have a target to aim for. And even if you don't hit the bullseye, you'll at least be a lot closer if there's a target that you're aiming at. You can't say, I'm going to be a better musician. That's, that's a terrible, I mean, it's not a terrible goal, but there's nothing measurable or specific or time bound about it. So the overarching goal might be to be a better musician, but then you create more smart goals around it. Now, we're running out of time, and I want to be respectful of your time, but what I want you to do tonight, maybe before lights out, instead of messing around on your phone, is write down, it says, create, using the SMART goal framework, create an aggressive goal and flesh it out using the SMART goal framework. And I would like you to share that with your sections tomorrow at breakfast. Cool? Like it. Section leaders, you help me with that one, yeah?
You make sure it gets done? OK. Now, as we're wrapping up, we're on the last page of the workbook. Last page. Uh, let me ask Joe, do you need me to stop? OK, thank you. Last page. Uh, raise your hand if you ever feel overwhelmed in your day. OK, I'll tell you why. It's because you react to everything around you. Because you react to what's happening. Wouldn't it feel amazing to be totally in control of your day? Here's how you do it. Time blocking. Now notice this is called becoming an implementation master. How do you actually implement these things? You time block. You're writing this down in number six, so, or sorry, number nine. So the blank is time blocking is creating a template for your daily schedule where every activity has a designated time. Some of the members have already sent me their time block schedules because I told you, hey, if you're feeling overwhelmed, watch my video on time blocking. Some people really exercise speed of implementation. Raise your hand if you watch my video on time blocking. OK, cool. Raise your hand if you made a schedule. Oh, look at that. Awesome. Give it up for those people. Stand up if you made a time block schedule. Stand up if you made a time block schedule. Come on. Let's go. Thank you. Thank you. If you're not standing, be like the people that are standing. That's speed of implementation right there. Now, the ideal schedule is ideal. You may not hit it every day, but that's the target. Here's the thing. We all have the same 24 hours in the day. I have the same 24 hours that you do. The only difference is I utilize them differently and better. That's the only difference. So by time blocking, you're able to do it. Now, I'm not going to talk too much about time blocking because I've got to wrap this up. Watch the video I've created on time blocking on my YouTube channel, and I'm going to create a more specific one for Crown coming up in the coming week. But for now, just watch the video I have on, it on my YouTube. You can do that at robstein.tv. S-T-E-I-N. Robstein.tv takes you right to my YouTube. Now, next one, number 10, as we wrap up. Tracking is the act of measuring your progress at regular intervals. So the more frequently you do it, the more in control of your results you will be. So I've talked about that, right? You keep a little journal, all right? So if you're trying to perform this exercise at this tempo by this date, by halfway until that date, you should be halfway to your goal. When I coach real estate agents that are like, I need to close four deals a month, cool. So by halfway through the month, how many deals should you be closing? Two. One week into the month, how many deals should you have closed? Right. So if you wait till the end of the month to, to measure your progress and you realize you didn't hit it, you can't do anything about it. But when you measure your progress, you can go, hey, I'm right on point. That's great. Or I'm not on point, so I better take more massive action because clearly it's going to take more effort than I thought it will. But by tracking your progress, you can actually be in control. And the more frequently you track, the quicker you can flex and adjust and create a new strategy to reach your goal. Make sense? OK, almost done here. Number 11, you're going to create a daily checklist with the most important items you need to do each day. This is like if you, if you were crazy busy and you only got these things done today, you can hit the pillow at night knowing you got it done. So whatever that is for you, I recommend you just create it, a little template. When you check every box, you're good to go. Last one. The uh, number 12, accountability is taking ownership of everything that happens to you, good and bad. And we've already talked about accountability, yeah? yeah. All right, I want to leave you with one thought. How do you think pros approach the off-season? Yeah, there is no off-season, baby! You know what I'm talking about? There is no off-season. Because the best in the here, well, I'll, I'll, amateurs have an off-season. Pros don't have an off season. You want to be the best in the world, or are you going to be like, I'll start being the best in the world in May? No. You don't say, man, I'm going to get so in shape during move ins. How about you show up in shape to move ins? Yeah. How about tonight, when lights go out, you put your phone down and go to sleep? How about half an hour before lights out, you put your phone down so you don't get that blue light and stop your melatonin from releasing? How about you stop whining about getting enough sleep because the reality is the staff gives you enough time, you're just not using it. Oh, you didn't see that one coming, did you? I'm going to be real with you right now. you got to take some ownership. You're signing up for an activity that is really hard. Do you agree drum corps is really hard? Yes. Yeah. You're also signing up for a really hard thing with one of the best groups in the world. You got to take ownership of that. 
Yeah, you know what? Sometimes you're going to get seven hours of sleep and you're still going to be tired. Obviously. Sometimes you're going to wake up and be like, oh, my knee hurts. Of course it does. Get on the field. Right? And like, you know, I mean, unless you're literally injured or something, but most of the time you're not. Grit, mental toughness, man. Get it done. Take ownership of the fact, okay? You know what I did last night? I went to sleep. You know what I did today? I got my mind right. I had people that wanted to book calls with me today. I said, I'm not available today because I got to focus for this thing that I'm doing right now. Right? When, when Olympic athletes have a meet the next day, you think they're messing around on social media all night? No, man. They go to sleep. They eat healthy. They drink their water. And so when I hear people say, we're not getting enough sleep, and I see all your phone screens on when lights are out, you get no pity from me, bro. Or bro it. Okay? None. Take ownership of the fact that you are a high performer. Guess what? There are going to be times when you pull into a housing site and it's late, and if you want to get the reps in and go to your show tomorrow, you might get five or six hours of sleep. You have two options. You can have a victim about it, or you can say, well, I want to be the best in the world, so it is what it is. And when I wake up, I'm going to be positive and I'm going to help my fellow core members be positive and I'm going to crush it today. Because no matter what, this is the amount of sleep that we're able to get and I can have two ways I can approach it, good or bad. Now, I promise you, your staff is prioritizing your health and fitness. Obviously, I'm here. Forte Athletics is here. But at some point, you have to take ownership of the fact that you're trying to be the best in the world. And it's not easy. You're going to be sleep deprived. You're going to be hungry. You're going to hurt. And that's when the not best in the world have a victim mentality and they don't do it. And they place the blame on everybody else. But I'm going to tell you something. You have the best people in the world with your interest at heart right now. I was very fortunate and blessed to have a two-hour breakfast with your CEO, Jim Williams, this morning. If you saw his vision for the core the way I saw it, I don't think I'm going to sleep tonight because of how excited I am. Joe Roach, your new director, do you know how much he cares about you and how good he wants you to be? Your staff, you have the best staff in the world teaching you how to do the things you need to do. You have the best people in the world writing your show. You have no excuses. If you don't get what you want, it's your fault. Good or bad. If you get what you want, that's your fault. And if you don't, that's your fault too. You're literally in the best in the world, with the best in the world, doing, giving you the best possible vehicle. And now, you've run out of excuses. And it's literally all on you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to turn to the person next to you and I want you to say, I'm taking ownership that I want to be the best in the world. Say it. Awesome. Now, lastly, I want you to really communicate with your sections on this because it's going to be too easy to leave tonight and be really motivated and then not implement it. So you have to support each other. Now, I'm meeting with the leadership tomorrow morning to talk about how we're going to do that. I recommend that you stay in touch with your sections on Slack, on texting. Did you get your exercises in today? Did you get your nutrition in today? Did you practice today? Are you being the best in the world today? Look in the mirror every night. Am I being the best in the world today? You take ownership of that. This core, no matter what the competitive outcome is at the end of August, is going to accomplish something that's never been done before, ever. And you're going to reach new levels of success that you never thought were possible. And it's going to be through implementation and instilling the high performance mindset. Yeah? yeah? Love you guys. That was awesome.